Hello YouTube. Have you ever seen more macadamia people in one place? This is Osmac 2024 in the Gold Coast Exhibition Centre. And I'm in a break in the proceedings at the moment. Everyone's having a break for morning tea. And I'm in the exhibition area where there's some amazing machinery on display. I don't know what some of this stuff is and I'm going to come back and look at it in a bit more detail. I have this one it looks like it belongs in a war somewhere. But there's exhib exhibitions from chemical providers, fertilizer providers, here's Echo Growth. Um, all the major processes are here, including Macadamia's Direct. Um, the machinery providers, I guess, are um, here with models that they think would appeal to Macadamia growers. So this particular tractor isn't too high off the ground. Looks like it's absolutely strong as an ox. And um, I'm not sure whether there's any more equipment outdoors. I'll find it if there is and show it to you. Um, but certainly amongst this crowd, there are a lot of macadamia farmers and a lot of related industry people who sell macadamias or things to do with them. Um, I'm mainly here, and I haven't yet found it here. Oh, look, I think I have found it. I'm here to buy a book by Ian McConaughey, who I can see up ahead. And he has written a book on the history of macadamias. And um, it's apparently a real good read. I'm going to be buying it myself and hoping that he can sign it for me. I may even get in a word with him. Um, other than that, look... My reasons for being here aren't, you know, I, I almost didn't come. There's a lot of lectures on things that are vaguely related to macadamias, but not entirely relevant to all of us. A lot of macroeconomic stuff, uh, a lot of facts that are available elsewhere, elsewhere if you're sort of fairly active on the internet. Other than that, though, look, the fee for coming along for one day is $325. And honestly... Um, for growers to pay that in order to be uh, serenaded by lots of companies who want to sell you things. Uh, I would have thought the fee for growers might be a little bit lower given that we're some, some sort of targets for marketing and paying to be marketed to. Um, having said that, I don't really mind that much and um, it's certainly it's a good networking opportunity. See who we can run into and speak to uh, while I'm here today. So, back with you shortly. Claire Hamilton Bates, CEO of the Australian Macadamia Society. I'm talking to all the big guns today, so I had to put you on the list. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> You've been in the position now for a bit over a year? Oh, two and a half years. Two and a half it years. Fly. Oh, it did fly, yes. Two and a half years. And were you here for the last OSMAC? I was. I inherited the last OSMAC because it had been postponed two or three times through COVID. I know. And yeah. So I came in, joined in July, um, and... This one seems bigger. It does seem bigger, doesn't it? It's actually a similar number of delegates. Right. Um, quite a different format. Um, and for, for us, it's really important to get more of the delegates here on the trade display. Yes. Engaging with the exhibitors. Because yeah. at the end of the day, we can only put it on if we have exhibitors and sponsors. Yes. Um, and so making this the hub of activity. Right. Um, and then having a program, as you've seen, that's got plenary sessions, it's got an innovation lounge, which is quick grabs, 15 minutes on new technologies, new innovations. Yes. And then the research hub, which has got 32, I think, researchers who are researching in macadamias, all presenting posters. So information Incredible. overload, but lots to look at. Well, to be supported by universities is just fabulous. But um, big question, yes. two and a half years, are you having fun? That's how you define fun, doesn't it? <laughs> a number of people have said to me, oh, I can't believe you're still here. Which, oh, really? Uh, no. Are, are macadamia farmers abrasive people? No, they're not. Are we, a, are we okay? You're okay, you're lovely. And okay. Because you've worked with lots of industries before this, haven't you? Have. you yeah. I've worked right across horticulture for the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, I always look to the macadamia industry. That always Because so many of the growers in macadamias have come from other professions. I used to joke with my predecessor that you've got a dream job. You know, you've got 
intelligent, well-informed, experienced growers. We've yeah. also got big corporates investing. You know, what could go wrong? How could it be hard? Now, I may have joined at a very, I did join. At a very well, at very time. challenging time, very of challenging course. Very challenging time. Yeah. But it's awesome. I think the collaboration, and I know probably you as a grower will say, oh no, there's all sorts of, you know. The, there may be divisions in the Oh, me, we don't look for conflicts. For no. me, I haven't seen I haven't seen that. And compared to, you know, I've worked a lot in the mango and avocado industries, the collaboration at a grower level, um, the cooperation and the assistance that people have provided to me and bringing me up to speed, because nuts are quite different to fresh produce. Yeah. Um, but right through the supply chain, you know, the, the handlers and processors, and you know, we have the Handlers Association. And remember, at the CAMS, we represent growers, handlers, processors, supply chain. Um, yeah, I'm in awe of the way the industry is structured because when I go to government or I have negotiations in terms of an advocacy type thing, saying we represent the industry and saying the industry talks very often as one voice is a real benefit. So, yeah, I think it's a great industry. I'm totally sold. I'm not going back to fresh produce. Oh, good. Oh, well, good. That's wonderful. Claire, thanks for your time today. I know you're busy. I'll let you get back to it and um, I'll go and appreciate the rest of what you've done. Pleasure. Thanks, Daniel. Cheers. Yeah. Now, this amazing machine, which looks like it's out of some horror movie, I found out uh, from my new best friend, Toby, from John Deere's dealership, that it's the global unmanned spray system. It includes a tractor, a spray unit, and a lot of fancy technology where the machine can basically go down a row of macadamia trees, turn around and do another row of macadamia trees, all with GPS mapping, and a LiDAR system, which means that it, where it doesn't see a tree, it actually turns off um, the spray unit so that it only applies spray where it absolutely needs to. Um, looks like it's good for long, flat rows of macadamia trees. I don't know how it would be on my farm. It's something like 170 horsepower built into this thing, but you obviously don't need a tractor to run it. And it can go largely unattended using a laptop. Um, and the farmer can get on with doing other things and of course staying away from spray tanks and chemicals that aren't 100% good for you. So, um, fantastic piece of equipment. But if you prefer your spray tanks in blue, I've got something for you here. Look at this. This machine has something like one, two, three, four, five spray fans I don't know how on earth you adjust them all it's on a massive tank and uh, I'd be pretty scared to drive this around my orchard how do you feel Ian McConaughey the man himself I, I couldn't wait to meet you in person and I'm showing a copy of your book which has just been released and you've signed it for me and you've been busy signing them off this morning um, as a history, it's amazing. You go back f to the very start of the industry and then in decades almost move all the way through. Your involvement started in the, is it the 60s or the 70s? It started in the 1960s. I, I worked for Goodman Fielders and uh, uh, they processed peanuts and cashews and uh, almonds and uh, I convinced them that uh, there was a future in macadamia uh, nuts. And I started to correspond uh, with people in Hawaii, yeah. and, uh, and also in South Africa in the 1960s. And uh, growers in Australia uh, were unhappy that CSR was dominating the industry. Yeah. So uh, I was asked to do assessments on Australian varieties. Okay. So that, that was in the 1960s. So uh, yeah, I go back a long way. There's a farm up in Queensland near Gympie. I think Marco Prenzel owns it now, or he's, he's, or he's, he, it has a lot of varieties that you brought over from Hawaii yourself, isn't that right? Yes, uh, 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 well we didn't bring them over from Hawaii yourself, but the, the DPI brought them uh, over and uh, we offered to plant them out to, to give an independent assessment uh, of them. I that see. That was on our own orchard uh, near, near Marco Prenzel's. Yes. And uh, we had about uh, 80 different varieties. Which yeah. Was crazy. Yeah. And uh, but out out of them, uh, one variety that uh, that we uh, assessed, uh, we grew and assessed, uh, 
uh, we, we've donated to the Macadamia Conservation Trust. And it's the MCT1? And, yeah. Yeah, I'm growing it myself now, mm. and, and the feedback on it in New South Wales is good. It wasn't really tested much in New South Wales, but we're catching up. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be seems to be a good performer, even in the weird conditions we've got this year. Yeah. Um, yes, the, the, uh, part of the problem with MCT1 was that uh, we, we didn't have the, maybe the vision, we didn't have the ability uh, to obtain independent data. Yeah. So... Mo- uh, we, we've been assessing it for 30 uh, years, but largely visually. Hand and eye method. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, particularly in New South, we, we didn't know how adaptable it was to different growing environments. We knew in Bundaberg and uh, Gympie it performed It was well. a star, yeah. So, uh, it seems it seems to be doing well in New South Wales as well. Yes, but we're getting... It's interesting, though, isn't it, that... that MCT1 gets released about the same time as uh, uh, was it G R P J, and I think most people are going for the MCT1 from what I'm from what I'm being told, and um, uh, so it, it, the hand and eye method still has a place. <laughs> yes, yeah. well, there's over 800,000 uh, MCT1 have been sold in Australia. Yeah, and the, the last figures I heard that the uh, uh, G and the N and the M. Uh, uh, there's a total of about 100,000. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing some things with R, because I, I sort of like R, and I I'm like to do some things with some of David Bell's new ones as yeah. well, because I, they... I, yeah, what do you think about them? I yeah. feel that David's new varieties are, uh, are very promising. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, the 447 is a little, little baby tree that, yeah. that manages to crop like a big adult yeah, sort of thing. Well, so. that's one of the things we've got to uh, grow uh, small to moderate sized trees, that, that, uh, particularly in the northern uh, rivers. That, uh, a major problem is trees are just growing too big. Growing too big. Mm. Yeah, they get out of control. Yeah, yeah. hence my orchard. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm growing some of those to, to experiment with. But, MCT one's now going global, it seems. So it's reached South Africa. Yeah, we've taken out uh, PBR uh, on it in a number of countries. Yeah. Uh, China uh, has not played the game. China has taken it and uh, will. And not paid for it. They're not paid uh, for it, and they're using it in their breeding as well. But uh, but uh, it, it, it's expected to be released in South Africa uh, early next year. It's been being bulked up at the moment. And, yes. Uh, so uh, I've seen the website of the company that's promoting it, and they're really giving it a, a big they're, promo. They're, yeah. It's been very impressive. And they've, yeah. They've handled it very well. Right? Well, it should do well there in a sense, shouldn't it? But, yeah. but it, it's a, it's a bit random about what does well yeah. where. Yeah. I mean, those eighty Hawaiian varieties you brought over yeah. in the in the 70s. Yeah. It, it looks like we really took up about eight of them, f- five of them maybe. And yeah, well, eight four two and eight four nine, and uh, 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 what else? Eight hundred was a disaster. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm fiddling around with seven eight eight because I, I, really? I yeah. I, and I brought that into Australia. And, I, I, uh, I know you uh, did. Yeah, there's a, a wonderful story about bringing it into Australia because we. Jen, uh, Jen, Jen's family were living in Hawaii, and we went over there. And uh, right. uh, the uh, oh, I can't think of his uh, uh, name. The plant breeder uh, said to me, "Get a chance, bring seven eight eight uh, over. Uh, I find out the procedure." So yeah. In in, in Hawaii, uh, when I asked the question, I said, "Oh, we'll give you some science to take back." Yeah. So I brought it back. Unique it, bloodline that one. Yeah, Very unique bloodline, the seven eight eight. Yes, it, yeah. we felt it was it was good, but it wasn't outstanding. At the, yeah. In plant breeding, we don't want a good variety. It's got to be you, something. You were looking for the elite. Better. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and the MCT one was described as elite, so it's yeah. something that's better than what's already planted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and the eight three five I also grow as well. I think oh, that's it. That's oh, another. Oh, that's oh, another one you br- you I brought over. Yeah. Look, it's got the highest whole kernel percentage of any nut yeah. you, you can grow, you know, st- statistically, and I just thought it might be relevant because everyone seems to want whole nuts these days. And The industry uh, has got to pay uh, for the percentage of whole kernels. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the price of kernels, that uh, whole kernels, is probably 40% higher. Yeah, so why aren't they paying that to the farmers who yeah, give it yeah, to they're them? They're not paying it to the farmers. Yeah. 
But if you want to encourage them to give whole kernels, obviously you've got to set a price that does it. Yeah. 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 So your book deals with uh, comments on the future, yeah. and and it's interesting because. I read an article from you in the 1970s talking about the future of the industry as well. And and some of what you said was fairly prophetic. Um, Your focus very much then was on improving the quality of nuts and and the, um, I guess, the appealing taste and and, and flavour and that sort of stuff. Is that still your view? You've always you've always valued quality over quantity. Yeah, well, my background was uh, in quality and food science, and uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I feel very strongly, particularly now, that uh, we're competing with the rest of the world, whose costs of production are generally much lower than Australia. Yes, we've got to differentiate our Australian kernel, and it, uh, we haven't had the focus on quality improvement in recent years that uh, we had in the 1980s and 1990s. That, uh, yeah. And uh, so our quality, our quality has been improved, yeah. but uh, the need to take it to the next step of raising the bar is the term I use. We've got to raise the bar on, on quality on and quality. Take, it, take it to the next level. Right? But are our new varieties focused on that or are they really more focused on tonnes of, tons of nut? Yeah. Quantity. But, but, I mean, MCT one. I can understand the quality argument there. It's got a high whole kernel. It's a large nut. It's desirable as a product. Yeah. So that lives up to your values. But some of the other ones coming out, are they? Now, there, ha- there hasn't been a strong emphasis on quality. It's it, it, it's all it's all about uh, probably precociousness. Uh, uh, firstly, yeah. yeah. Uh, desirable three characteristics. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, primarily yield, yield of kernel yeah. uh, rather than yield of nut and shell. Uh, is, I mean, MCT1 does happen to be precocious. Yeah. But is it a real must, in your opinion? Is it a real? Is it a real must? Do you really have to go for precocious? Well, uh, the advantage of it is it gives, gives you a much earlier cash uh, uh, flow. There's, there's one orchard uh, in Glasshouse Mountains. Yep. The MCT ones are two years old. And they're cropping. And they're getting a commercial crop. Uh, wow. Yeah. But the, the other uh, point that I think that should be considered is that many orchards have older trees. Mm. And if you can plant a precocious variety, you get back into producing income mm. uh, much earlier. So I, I'm hoping that the industry will see the benefit of uh, uh, replanting uh, parts of the orchard that uh, it, it, it makes sense that uh, uh, an orchard should be rejuvenated that yes. uh, uh, varieties or trees that aren't performing yeah. should be replaced that, uh, and that a replanting scenario is better than endlessly pruning these older varieties that we're sticking with, perhaps. Yeah, it dep- depends on the uh, on the circumstances, but uh, yeah. uh, so a lot of the northern rivers has that issue, as you know. You know yeah. it's we're, we're full of old orchards yeah. of two tall trees yeah. and and below average yields, yeah. and yeah. people are getting sick of it and just bulldozing the lot and then leaving macadamias. Yeah. But but there's got to be a better way yeah. for for rejuvenating. Yeah. 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 Um, one other question. This is a bit out of left field. Um, my, my dad used to work for a peach farmer when he retired yeah. and wanted something to do. This old German peach farmer would pull up every peach tree that reached 20 years old yeah. and plant a new one. Yeah. And his idea was, by the time a tree reaches 20, it's losing its sap flow, it's not doing its best, yeah. you might as well replace it with a new one. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever move that way with macadamias? I, or, or they're good I, for better I than... I doubt whether we would. Yeah. Uh, the problem is... Uh, Maybe not so much the tree age as the tree size. Yes. And uh, that uh, uh, I haven't been to the Baffle Creek orchards for a number of years, but their their orchard that was planted in the 1960s yeah. uh, had been rejuvenated, and and were, were producing around about four tonne of nut and shell per hectare. But, uh, right. Uh, so uh, again, depending on individual orchards, it it may be possible. Uh, to rejuvenate orchards so they have a long life. We, yeah. Uh, but once they've got away on you too far, it's probably best to look at a replant. Yeah. Again, it's probably not relevant at the moment, but South Africa is, is, is publishing a series of reports yeah. on the potential of the Northern Rivers, Macadamias. 
Yeah. And uh, that uh, essentially they are saying that the, the the very many just the very many of the older uh, orchards with large trees yeah. don't have a future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that's not mine, but <laughs> I'll, I'll have to work out something. Yeah. But to me, it seems logical that uh, if you if you have an orchard that uh, that uh, they should reach a stage where there's newer varieties are available, or you have problems with some of your uh, trees or varieties, yep. that they should be replaced. So, uh, yeah, I, I would think a a, a sound uh, mature orchard that uh, maybe five percent should be replanted each year, and, uh, and to keep it cycling. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Ian, um, other people are waiting to see you, So, but thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honour because, you know, I, I love this industry and, as you know, I document it as much as possible and I, and I speak to people as much as possible who have a history in the industry, like uh, 30 and 40 years in and that sort of thing. So to, uh, to meet one of the old gurus was a real privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. On this stand here is an example of some of the finest products made from macadamias and if you look closely you'll see labels that if you're a regular subscriber you will have seen before. Gondwana macadamias have got a lot of products here today, uh, some of which we've seen before, some of which look actually new. And over on this stand is the food products. We've got some macadamia cheese there with some nice herbs macadamia satay sauce, uh, macadamia chocolate, and the crumbs that we saw, including the reef line, which looks like it's come out now. I ran into Mel Cashaniga, uh, sorry, uh, a bit earlier today, and she was quite proud of all this, and she's been networking like crazy. And of course, the macadamia milk, which can make a reasonable cup of coffee. The earlier macadamia milks, if you were turned off by them, Give it another try because the new ones actually aren't bad. Mark Duncan, what are you doing here? Oh, we're here with, with uh, biological services and bioresources. So right, right. The, um, we've got the matrix wasps and the anastatus and a few green lace wings here. As, what, as what's well. in here? Well, they're the um, green lace wings. Oh, I can see them moving around. Yeah. Oh, I'll just get the camera in close. There's some pupae there as well. So Now, these things will eat lace bug. Yeah, they fruit, fruit spotting. They don't eat fruit spotting probably, bug. No, not no. Just the mainly generalist predators. Yeah. Just the, the, the lace, the lace bugs and pelicosis uh, and, and little caterpillar eggs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And and these are the sheets that you've given me many years in a row. But that's right. Those are the matrix wasps. Yep. The the trichogramma. Yep. The black eggs. And what are these ones that's here? The anastatus. The anastatus eggs. They're much bigger eggs, aren't they? Uh, that, well, yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're, um, they're actually silkworm eggs. They breed the anastatus on silkworm eggs because they parasite them. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, um, they're much easier to um, mass rear that way than the anastatus. Or, but the idea is to put these out in the bug breeding areas. Right. Um, so you're not necessarily going to spray them. You know, when you do your Yes, spotting bug sprays, but we, we hope that we you, you know you can cut down on the on the flights in, in, right. into the orchard. Yeah. Now I know we spread these around Christmas time, but when would you recommend spreading these? Uh, look, in these could actually go all year round. Yep. So you, you might do these weekly, but these sort of you do them every three to four weeks. Yeah. Because that's how that's their sort of life cycle. Um, but yeah, you're targeting the bug breeding areas. You. In the northern rivers, you wouldn't put them in in the winter. Yep. Uh, because they're not very active and either a spotting bug generally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, the Queensland guys use these pretty much all year round. Will standard pesticides kill the anastatus? Ah, uh, yes. Like Trevor and. and uh, Trevor's a, a, a bit softer on it, but. Um, Transform? Ah, uh, yes. I mean, they'll all have. You know, some negative effect. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it's a really matter of balancing what you want to do. Yeah, it's just a matter of being more targeted with your um, spray approach, really. And right. um, yeah, it's not just hey, the other status. You sort of, if you're going to go soft on your sprays, yeah, you want to be, you know, it's, just, it's the spiders and, and and all the other predators and all other parasites as well. So, yeah. Um, once the, I mean, once the spotting bug does fly in, yep. um, 
anastatus can't stop the damage from it flying in, but we're targeting the bug breeding areas right. so to stop it from flying in. And Mark, what's happening in your farms at the moment? Is, is not, you know, we've had such high rainfall and then there's that heat wave. Are we headed for a bad year or what's going on? What do you think? What's your best guess? Oh, I think the... I think yields are going to be down for sure. Right. Um, I'm still hopeful that there's significant nut up in the tops of the trees. Right. Um, I don't know you'll find any in my 344s, um, but are there some varieties that are doing better than others out of those conditions? The 344s haven't done particularly well. They don't look good. Um, I, I think, you know, your 838s and your 816s and some of the older Hawaiians like the triple threes are going well. My triple threes are gangbusters. See, and this, yeah, is, yeah. this is why I think it's... I'm a fan of the triple three yeah. now. I mean, it may have lower kernel recovery, but yeah. nothing touches it. I know. And, and, and yeah. I just think that the canopy structure... It's nice and round. Yeah, the deep green. I, I actually think it's an energy a photosynthesis issue because, I mean, our heart stuff, you know, March, April, yeah. it was wet. Yeah. Um, well, certainly February, March was. Um, and then we had as wet as August on record. Yeah. So a lot of cloud cover days. 200 mils in August, 300 mils in September. That's yeah. what Rosebank got. So I yeah. think it would be good for them to maybe look at, you know, UV um, ratings. And canopy efficiency. Canopy efficiency and maybe those triple threes are just more, you know, efficient at getting... Converting sun energy. to energy. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, anyway. That's, that's great. Mark, thanks for your contribution. Oh, geez, I'll move on. Yeah, yeah. And off in another room here, the Hort Innovation Research Hub. Just a place you can come to browse and look at a number of different bits of information that you might consider relevant or interesting in your own farm research. Um, there's surveys to fill in. Um, there's new ideas for dealing with erosion. I particularly like this one, these roll-out concrete mats, which, uh, which just look fabulous to me in terms of maintaining tracks and roads in the farm, particularly when we're talking about higher than average rainfall. So lots of interest here as people eat their lunch and well worth a look if you come to the OSMAC conference. Peter Fraser, what are you doing here? I thought you knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you always find something you don't know. Yeah. Uh, this sort of thing. Um, I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm hoping there's something. Uh, for, for 325 bucks, there should be something, shouldn't there? I mean, right. yeah, I, I'm, I was having a grumble about the price going, you know, we're paying a lot to be marketed to here. Um, but um, yeah, I wanted to ask, how's your how's your nut set going? Because it's been a topic a lot of farmers have raised with me, and people are telling me the three four fours are doing horribly and all that sort of stuff. But what's Nutty Glen doing? Can you see at this stage? Yes, uh, you can just see them a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah. just big enough now, and all the varieties. And I think there's a pretty good crop. Oh, good. Uh, three four four good but perhaps patchy and I don't know why but yeah. some trees have as many nuts as you could open others don't have many at all yeah or they have a, a patch on the tree where there's no nuts and the rest of the tree is good yeah I hadn't seen this before but I'd, I'd say it's possibly um poor control of lace bug right um a A16 seem to be doing okay for me. Um, that seemed to be one of the ones that are doing better for me at the moment. So it, it, I, I thought there was virtually none, but they look all right. Yeah. I'd say an average year for them. Not a good year, but an average year. Um, Were you scared after the rain we had? I mean, yes. 200 mils in August, 300 mils in September. We're really meant to be getting about 130 mils for the both well, uh, combined. <laughs> Yes, yes, extraordinary. Uh, and the hot weather as well in between. You know, we had 10 or 11 days of really over heat 30 wave. And uh, four of them got over 35 or 235. But, you know, extraordinary weather for uh, a tree to cope with. Yeah. So much rain. Uh, correlation between rainfall and um, nut yield is um, pretty extreme uh, in that 
a lot more rain, the less yield over every single year that we've grown in on our north coast area. Uh, you you always are the view that so a dry, a dry is, year is a good year. It's been the driest ever. Yeah. No, but the wettest ever. The wettest ever. ever. Yes. And, and yet you still seem to be doing okay. Well. We hope. I, I, I think the, the bonus came with a very hot, long, dry period. Yeah. Uh, and it was covered a lot of the flowering, but not all of it. So the heavy rain came a little bit early and a little bit late to destroy the flower. Yeah. Uh, and there was not, and in between was the dry hot weather. And I, I personally believe it's a bit controversial, um, but uh, that pollination is very much a part of low humidity. Yeah. And, and the pollen uh, isn't transferred much by insects because this year we see virtually no opportunity for insects to do the pollination job where all the flowers are over and done with in two weeks. And we didn't uh, have that many bees. And, well, uh, you can't get pollinators, you can't get... Uh, you, well, you can't pay for them. ...apirists without yeah. paying possibly about $5,000 it would cost me. Oh, God. And, yeah, it, it used was, to be free. Yeah, well, that's right. I've well, they give you, a couple of jars of, give you a couple of jars of honey as well. Yeah. But the last time I arranged, he did arrange to apirist. He didn't turn up because he got paid. He uh, went somewhere else. Uh, so you got to just be, didn't yeah, turn up. That's and when the, I rang him up, he ummed and ahed, but I figured out it, he just didn't get paid. So, uh, But look, I, I don't think the insects could potentially be very good pollinators for macadamias. And when you get a big supply of insects like the moths arrive or uh, whatever, uh, was bees it? are prolific, sure. Or you can get an apiris in there, sure. They probably uh, is the best way to pollinate. But I think that most cross-pollination must be occurring when well, this year illustrates it is uh wind from wind and low humidity low humidity that's it there's some studies in south africa now saying that moths the moths they have in south africa pollinate at night more than the bees do during the day so i, I don't know whether that's the last, happening with us the last yeah. good year we had was a very good year for the moths i think they're called the bogons or, oh, bogons bogons. or something oh well they're great and they arrive for... just at the right time which they don't always yeah uh, and uh you know sensational uh, cross pollination and, and and crop that year. Yeah, uh, they haven't been around in these last troublesome years. No, I've not. I haven't uh, seen them. I haven't but seen them. Was the good year two thousand and seven by any chance? That was that, oh. that, that, that was the year everyone had a bumper crop, no matter what they did. So yeah, except me. Except oh, except <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, right. We had a hailstorm in January that year. Yeah. And, and with the rain, when's a safe time to fertilise? Would you be? Are you doing it now, or you you're waiting a bit? Well, I only put compost on. Yep. Uh, so it That's doesn't my really plan. matter. You can put it on any time of year, really. Okay. But um, uh, after so much heavy rain, it's good to get some on. Yeah. Because uh, you know we've had a lot of rain. Yeah. Uh, and so it must have lost. A fair it, bit of it would have leached something, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 No, so fair enough. Um, Okay, so looking forward to good things. Thank. Oh, look, I think I was very pessimistic two weeks ago. Yep. Uh, it might still not be as good as it looks uh, if they're if they're not cross pollinated, which is what you'd expect with the events that have occurred. Yeah. But uh, and the lack of time for bees to make any difference. Yeah. But. It looks pretty good. Um, they're starting to size up and they're quite visible and there's plenty of them. Yeah. Whether they're cross-pollinated and produce great nuts will need another few more weeks yeah. to see that. Do you, uh, do you think the self-pollinated nuts are the ones that shed? Is that your theory? Yeah. There's certainly a theory that supports yeah, that. Yeah, oh, no, I think it's a pretty solid theory, that one. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, so um, there is shedding going on, which is a very good sign, unless it's just from lack of pollination. Yeah. Uh, but no, they look good. They look to have kernel in them. Great. Fantastic. Peter, thanks for your contribution. No worries. <laughs> okay. Well, what a day that was. Hope you enjoyed talking to the uh, guests I 
got and um, are certainly very generous with their time, some of them. Um, there's some more lectures going on in the afternoon. Look, the feedback from the morning lectures were there's a lot of stuff that um, we already know or can get from other sources and a relative lack of practical information that farmers can use in their own farms. But on a scientific level, on an academic level, um, and yeah, to an extent some of the marketing stuff, it is kind of good to know. And if you can get an update on something like that once every two years, you won't get overly bored. That's probably just about right. So, back off to Nutkin Farm now. Hope you enjoyed yourself. I'll be in touch again very soon.